Hello, this is Larry Wilson, and I'd like to welcome you to tape number 14 in this 209 series titled Shadows of God. Actually, today's tape will be number 8 in the portion on Isaiah. Isaiah is a large book, and Dave and I have just been taking our time waltzing through Isaiah. Dave uh, Brooks is here in the studio with me. Welcome, David. Glad to be here. It's always a joy to get together to study God's Word and to look um, in its pages. And um, we have been actually taking our, our good old time going through Isaiah, tasting each chapter, looking at those portions of Scripture that reveal the love of God and the ways of God and the plans of God uh, as only can be expressed through time. When you study the Bible, you can't race through it. When you study God's Word, you have to approach it very uh, thoughtfully, very carefully, very uh, humbly, um, systematically. Systematically, excellent. And it took a long time to write it, so it ought to take some time to read it and study it. Well, it took Isaiah, you know, the better part of 50 years to write this. And I'm constantly amazed at the, uh, at the readability yes. of it. The, the, yes. Even the poetry section, and, and trust me, folks, I'm not one of those guys that really enjoys a lot of poetry. And a lot of Isaiah has a lot of poetry in it. But one of the things about it is if, if, you, if you really look at what he's saying, it makes an awful lot of sense as he tries to find the words to express yes. God's love, God's care, God's plans, the, the things that God has in mind for us. Yes. Sometimes it just takes a while, and it seems that these are the kinds of words and phrases that only can express it. That's the neat thing. God has chosen a type of language that is dramatic both on, both on both ends of the scale. It can be as explosive as it can be tender. It can be cutting as well as healing. It can, it can be uh, in your face or it can be, come now, let us reason together. Mm -hmm. So poetry is a type of language that includes emotion, that includes the dimensions that feeling uh, provides. It's not just the cold, hard, bare facts. When you get notice from the IRS that you're going to be audited, there's no poetry on earth that can describe the feeling. <laughs> <laughs> Been there, done that. <laughs> um, on the other hand, I'm just trying to, you know, convey the idea that God chose this form of language because not only are the are, are the sentiments expressed so marvelous, the the whole process is so um, revealing. It is a revelation of what God is like. And I'm amazed how it has been preserved. Now, I'm not sure how he originally wrote this down. I don't know if it was on a piece of leather or a piece of cloth or a piece of crude paper. But somehow or the other, he got this written down, and it has been preserved all th through all the ages so that we could have an opportunity to read this. Yes. And uh, to me, that is just a miracle in it, itself. It is. It really is. Um. You know, just the other day, I was driving down the highway, and I drove past a graveyard. And I looked out there in the graveyard, and um, I, I looked around at the headstones, and I noticed that none of them looked to be more than 100 years old. And I thought to myself, well, that's strange. This country's been here 200 years. Where are all the gravestones for the first 200 and 
for the first 150 years. You know, I, I said it, our country is about 250 years old. Okay. Um, where are the, where are the uh, gravestones for for the first 150 years? Well, there was some wood that was involved in headstones back in the old days. Well, but I'm saying if something uh, that is intended to be a monument can mm -hmm. disappear, what is the likelihood of a book written on some leather? Biodegradable material. Yes. What, what, what is the likelihood of that enduring and becoming part of the most famous book on all the earth? And if it weren't for the copies, it wouldn't have because That's the original... Right. Obviously, is gone. Yes, yes. But it's interesting, here in America, we think of something that's 30 to 40 years old as an antique. Mm -hmm. Over in England, mm -hmm. if it's not 1,500 years old, don't even think about it. I mean, <laughs> we're, we're not, the amortization schedule on a house is like 300 years. Yes, I mean, yes. Things are made out of rock. Right. Going to be here. Right, right. Okay, we're going to pick up here in um, Chapter 42 where we left off in the last few verses of 42. And um, I, I want to ask you to read, David, uh, verse 19. Okay, of uh, 42. Mm -hmm. Who is blind but my servant, and deaf like the messenger I send? Who is blind like the one committed to me, blind like the servant of the Lord? God is asking a question and he's calling Israel his servant. And um, God chose uh, Israel to be his servant, to be his representative upon the earth, to be his um, ambassadors of, of goodwill to all mankind. And here we are, prior to the Babylonian captivity, and God is saying, as he looks around upon the earth, in verse 18, Hear, you deaf, look, you blind, and see. Who is blind upon the earth but my servant? <laughs> <laughs> Who is deaf like the messenger I send? Sounds like some kids. <laughs> my two sons, once in a while, will get deaf and blind. No matter what you tell them, they don't get it. You know, you have to, now guys, yeah. back up and punt here. Yeah. Verse 20, you have seen many things, but have paid no attention. Your ears are open, but you hear nothing. And my wife says that about me. <laughs> Got to be careful here. You're stepping on toes. Now. It pleased the Lord for the sake of his righteousness to make his law great and glorious. But this is a people plundered and looted and all of them trapped in pits or hidden away in prisons. And, and God is, says in verse 23, Which of you will listen to this or pay close attention in time to come? Who handed Jacob over to become loot and Israel to the plunderers? Was it not the Lord against whom we have sinned? For they would not follow his ways. They did not obey his law. So he poured out upon them his burning anger, the violence of war. It enveloped them in flames, yet they did not understand. It consumed them, but they did not take it to heart. Wow. You know, you made a comment the other day that I've been thinking about since you said it. The abomination of desolation, what insult could happen to God that would make him so angry that he would begin the casting down of the censor and the things that are predicted there in the book of Revelation. And, uh, you know, here in the last couple of weeks, we've had a couple of things to happen. We've had Hurricane Floyd, which has decimated an awful lot. And we've had a shooter to actually go into a church service. Baptist church there in Fort Worth go into the church with a weapon and kill people and wound people during a church service in the sanctuary. Yeah. And I was just wondering, could that be an insult that um, would allow God to pour out his anger, his burning anger, the violence of war? I mean, what, what more dramatic event could happen 
than to have an abomination of desolation occur in the sanctuary of God. Well, um, when Antiochus, back in 168 B.C., carried a sow into the temple Mm -hmm. and offered it on the altar... Boy, that sounds like an abomination, doesn't it? The Jews considered it the abomination that causes desolation, and they it, it, it ignited the great Maccabean revolt, which lasted for three years, 168 to 165 B.C. And um, Antiochus hated the Jews, and, and, and I might mention it was mutual. Reciprocal. <laughs> yeah. Um, and he did this just out of pure honoriness. Now, when God looks at the whole world, the entire world, he is deeply offended by any act of violence. He is deeply hurt when murder, like uh, took place there in the Baptist church in Fort Worth, takes place. And all of these add up in the cup of iniquity for the earth in general so that when earth's cup is full God springs into action now I want to say that my study of the Old Testament and the New as as well does not leave me with the opinion that God springs into action when something very big and very large Uh, is offensive, necessarily. Rather, it's more like the little straw that breaks the camel's back. Where it's the last drop you put in the cup that makes it flow over. That's right. That's right. In other words, the whole cup has to be full, but there's finally one thing that trips the trigger. That trips the trigger. And uh, and, and in, in Israel's time, they had gotten so far away from God in Isaiah's day that God, God could no longer get their attention. He could no longer lead them. He could no longer instruct them. He could no longer use them. Totally, they had become totally useless. And that's when he, I don't know just exactly which sin made the cup overflow, but I can tell you that the warning of being at, you know, full cup is all through Isaiah. And finally, God sprang into action. Uh, notice of chapter 43. We're going to move into 43. How that with the threatening that has been mentioned in 42, God pours out his burning anger and, and the violence of war. Notice how he turns back around and becomes so compassionate and forgiving. He says in verse 1, But now this is what the Lord says, He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Seba in your stead. Since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you, I will give men in exchange for you and people in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid. I am with you. I will bring your children from the east, gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I have formed and made, let them come. Now, in verse 10, You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, 
and my servant, whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me there is no Savior. I have revealed and saved and proclaimed, I and not some foreign God among you. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God. Yes, and from ancient days, I am He. No one can deliver out of my hand when I act. Who can reverse it? I think these are such wonderful words. Wonderful in the sense that God is de defining here in these chapters, 43, 44, 45, through 47, God is defining who He is. It's like He has come down from heaven and He's talking to a crowd of people who have never before considered what He is or who He is. And He starts with the fact that He's the Creator, the yes. one who formed them. Yes. He keeps coming back to that theme. Yes. Verse 15, I am the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's Creator, your King. You know, this is actually Jesus who is speaking. This is Jesus who is actually talking through Isaiah to his people. The creative arm of the, of the Trinity. Yes, yes. God says here in verse 18, Look, forget the former things. Let's not dwell on the past. See, behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not see what I'm doing? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. I'm, I'm going to, if you will, turn from your evil ways. We don't have to go here all the way to destruction. I'm willing to forget the past. I'm willing to erase it. I'm willing to cover your sins and hide them so that they can never be seen again. But, verse 22, you have not called upon me, O Jacob. You have not wearied yourselves for me, O Israel. You have not brought me sheep for burnt offerings, nor honored me with your sacrifices. I have not burdened you with grain offerings, nor wearied you with demands for incense. You have not brought any fragrant calamus. For me, or lavished on me the fat of your sacrifices, but you have burdened me with your sins and wearied me with your offenses. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. Review the past for me and let us argue the matter together. State the case for your innocence if you truly are. Your first father sinned, your spokesman rebelled against me, so I will disgrace the dignitaries of your temple and I will consign Jacob to destruction and Israel to scorn. God is frustrated. What is a parent to do? What do you do with a child whose heart is so filled with rebellion that it cannot be corrected. Just simply refuses to listen to anything you have to say or any logic, any reason. Nothing matters. And that's, that's the condition of the, uh, of the entire country. Then and now. Mm -hmm. Then and now. I found it interesting... Um, he says, I blot out your transgressions for my own sake. Not for their sake, mm -hmm. but for his sake. They don't care. Right. He does. They mm -hmm. don't. Mm -hmm. He's the one with the broken heart. Not them. He's the one pining away. Not them. Can we start over? You know, is this, is this something we... I'm willing to forget every bit of this mm -hmm. if, if we'll start over here mm -hmm. and build a clean slate, mm -hmm. slate going here. Mm -hmm. And then apparently they're not willing to do that. No, no. That's why the sounds of uh, 
war only grow louder. And as we are progressing into Isaiah, we're going to see that God eventually, remember this, this is being delivered over a period of time, and Israel is not responding. The EKG is, not, is still flat. <laughs> Trying the to get, heart's not beating. Trying to get a pulse on Israel. <laughs> and there, there is none. And God, is, he, he tries through threats. He tries through entreaty. He tries through every emotional dimension. And that's what makes this poetry so marvelous to really dwell upon and to think about. God is using every dimension of human experience to try to get the heart to beating. And who could be more creative at this? I mean, God knows how we're built. Yeah. He knows how we're put together, yes. and he knows what we'll respond to. Yes. But something has occurred that yes. has deadened all of the senses to any stimulus that yeah. would get the heart beating again. Absolutely. The devil has come in and has so polluted the water that you can't see the bottom. And there's no way to come back. That's right. let's, let's go to 44.1. But now listen, O Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. This is what the Lord says. He who made you, who formed you in the womb, and who will help you. Do not be afraid, O Jacob, my servant. Jeshurun, whom I have chosen, for I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. I can't do that for you, but I will the next generation. I can't save this one, but I will the next. This is the same song but only a different verse that went with the 40 years in the wilderness. God says, I can't save this generation, but I will begin anew with the next one. The part of that that bothers me is that in the book of Revelation, it says your young men and your young women will see visions and dreams. And you mean in the book of Joel there? Okay. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and it, uh, the young people... Is there a generation here that's going to have to die? Yes. Isn't that a thought? Yeah, the generation here is totally, they're beyond. Beyond help. Help. Biology will have to solve the problem. Yes. Yes. In the end time, mm -hmm. be the same way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The Lord um, is promising that he's going to give Israel a chance, but it's not going to be this Israel. Under plan B, the Israel that God gives a chance to is a different Israel than under plan A. For exactly the same reason. For exactly the same reason. That's the point. Yeah. Here, you, you know, uh, I've used the illustration many times how that in the wilderness situation, God brought one Israel out of slavery into the wilderness. But that's not the Israel that he took into the promised land. And the parallel here is that the Israel that God chose in the Old Testament to, to be his witnesses and to be a light into the world is not the Israel that he ends up with. The parallel being identical. Uh, in verse 6, this is kind of an interesting point. This is what the Lord says, chapter 44, Israel's king and redeemer, the Lord Almighty, I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. Well, how does that square with what Jesus says in Revelation 1 8? 
I am the Alpha and the Omega. Apart from me, he says, there is no other God. It's identical. The parallel. It's the same person. It's the same person. Yeah. Same process of the plan. That's correct. That's correct. Well, in chapter 44, God goes on and he is condemning Israel because they sought to worship worthless idols, things that they could make and see with their hands. I've often wondered about this, and, then think, and I think I have an explanation that might be helpful to some of our listeners. I used, I've wondered, what was it in ancient times that caused pe people religious people to want to create a God that they could see. I mean, do you have a tendency, David, to want to go out and carve up a tree and make a God that you can see? Do, do you have <laughs> this inborn tendency? No, as a matter of fact, if you put some chisels and sharp instruments <clears throat> in my hand, it would be dangerous to the citizenry of the county. <laughs> But uh, <clears throat> why would they want to do that? What, what is it? Is it they they need something that's a symbol of a god, or do they really believe that this block of wood is the god? See that that's a puzzle I've always had. Now I you know we have maps. You have these lines on a piece of paper that are symbols of 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 the boundary of a state, or the boundary of a country. And we need that in order to be able to get from place to place because it gives us a representative of the real thing. And I've often wondered, did it originally start out that people needed something to act as a representation for something that they could not see? I would answer no. They actually need something that they think I, I, think I, yes. I think I have found the answer to this puzzle. And I may be wrong. I mean, I can only offer an opinion. Is it going to get expensive? Yes. <laughs> just just the, charge the, it against what you already owe me. All know. right. <laughs> the children of Israel had a religious economy that was very large. The books of Genesis through Deuteronomy, the books of Moses, uh, encompass a God who is very large. And He is so large that A, you can never fully understand everything. B, it requires a level of integrity and honesty that is a killer. Elusive at best. Well, if you're not born again, if you don't have the born again experience, living with a God who is so ever present and all knowing and all knowing is torturous. It is. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, that's why. When you try to impose some religious or some God-given command upon the carnal heart, the carnal heart will immediately declare war and go into a battle posture. Because there's no love there at all. That's correct. The answer to my mystery and, and, and research on this topic is this. Israel found that the gods of the pagans were a lot more fun than the god that was everywhere that they couldn't see. In other words, it was more controllable. It was a lot more fun because the, the god of the Baal, um, he encouraged, you know, Baal encouraged mm -hmm. sexual immorality. Baal encouraged drunkenness and feasting Baal was, since, since Baal, the religion of Baal is a false religion, its very center is all about self-fulfillment. 
And he stays in one place all the time. Yeah. Yeah, we go to see Baal. Mm -hmm. Baal can't see us once right. we're out of the building. That's right. That's right. Um, and so Baal is there and we're here. Mm -hmm. Therefore, he's more controllable in right. their own minds. You know, yes. we can control the God, yeah. not God controlling, controlling us. us. Right. right. He, God isn't in, intruding into our space. We go over into his space. And we leave him alone. He leaves us alone. Yeah, yeah. And we get permission from our God to do this stuff mm -hmm. that we like to do. Mm -hmm. Where over here, on the other hand, yeah. we don't get that permission. Yeah. When I was in the Army, one of my favorite expressions uh, for defending my rather unique ways, it's against my religion. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that went over very well. Well, I'd say to the guy you know, who, who has a different point of view, I said, well, what does your religion say about this? <laughs> Well, he says, my religion doesn't say anything about it. I said, so you're free. You're free to do whatever you want, see? He said, well, I like my religion better. <laughs> in other words, you didn't make too many converts. Well, your... <laughs> well, I wasn't trying to make any converts in those days. I'm just saying that when you have a God who is more fun and not as demanding or not as, as close... And if your heart is carnal, it suits you a much, much better. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm leading up to the ultimate point is that in today's world, most of the Protestants don't worship images. So what do Protestants do? How do they express idolatry today? Because idolatry is just as prevalent today as it is and was in the days of Israel. I guess it depends on what you put in front of yourself. Where do you spend your time? No, no, you're, 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 you're right, but I, I'm... You're headed in a different I'm, direction. I'm, I'm headed in another direction. All right. My answer to my own question... <laughs> since you're the since, only one that's got it. <laughs> that's right, since it's only in my mind, <laughs> is this... Christians today have created their own God, and they call him Jesus. But they try to control him? Is the same desire to control still there? Absolutely. This is why Christians have a diversity of behavior. And one Christian will say, no, God doesn't care about that. God's not interested in that. You know, God's Word doesn't teach that. In other words, Christians have fallen into the same thing that the pagans do of creating their own God. In other words, they want Jesus to look like they want Him to look like. That's what I mean. They want Him to have the powers that they want Him to have. Yes. So they can build their own... And, justi Definition. and justify their own actions. Whatever and their own they want to do. Yeah. Jesus said, those who love the light come into the light so that their deeds might be seen for what they are. They're, in, they're in open words, hearted. Truth, truth and reality yeah. are still real. Yes. Okay. But those who, who love evil prefer the darkness. So they build their own religion. They build their own religion. And it's in the And darkness. that's what Baal was, simply a man-made religion. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the Jews uh, in Isaiah's day, the reason that they prostituted themselves and followed the gods of the pagans is because they saw that this was a... Uh, this fed the carnal nature. Well, what... What responsibility did the leaders have in all of this? Did, did the Levites just abdicate? Did they just walk away from the church services and the, and, the, and the temple sanctuary services and just say, okay, folks, you can do whatever you want to do? Starting with Aaron, most preachers are cowards. In other words, if you get a group of people big enough they're going to do whatever the group of people wants to do. They're going to do whatever is polit politically expedient. Okay. Even if it calls for creating a golden calf. Most p 
preachers are cowards. They do not enjoy the tension that comes from rebuking sin. sin. Well, look what happened to, uh, was it Eli's sons? Yes, or Eli. Yeah, Eli. I, I mean, they insulted God tremendously mm-hmm. here, and God, it, it, it was mm-hmm. such a bad insult. Mm-hmm. See, we're sort of back to that thing again. Mm-hmm. It was such an insult, God had to do something about it. Mm-hmm. He had to mm-hmm. deal with it. Yes. Well, the point, the point of all of this is that God... God has a problem. The problem is you have the carnal nature of mankind and the weakness of the clergy, the, the priests. Mm-hmm. When you put the two together, it is only a matter of time until both are in the ditch. If a preacher has a change of heart, and learns a new truth, and he stands up in the pulpit to tell the flock, what happens? You better be prepared to get hung <laughs> or chastised <laughs> severely. Oh, he's going, to be, he's going to be carried out of town on a rail, and two of the head elders, our bishops, our deacons, mm-hmm. will be carrying the rail. Mm-hmm. There'll be tar and feathers everywhere. That's right. Uh, Preachers generally are cowards, and this is the problem. People don't, preachers don't like to be going around naked and exposed as Isaiah. People, you know, to to bear this burden and to say these words for 50 years of ministry that Isaiah did was an enormous undertaking and an enormous burden yes and if it hadn't been for the power of god he could not he have could not it. he could not have endured it yeah that's right well what how does this face with the um the people in the end times who are going to have to bear a tremendous burden the, with a tremendous message the hundred forty four thousand mm-hmm. uh will be rejected and scorned and ridiculed and persecuted and tortured like no other group of people on earth. And ultimately killed, probably. Many, or if not all, will die in the line of duty. It's a very solemn thought. Over a piece of wood. Look at, look at verse uh, 15 of uh, chapter 44. Here, you take a piece of wood, use part of it to, to burn in the fire and heat yourself and cook your wood. And, All right. And the other piece of it, you bow down to it and ask it to bless your family. Yes. Hello. Yes. <laughs> yes. Half the wood he burns in the fire, the other half he bows down as, as to an idol. And he says, prays to it in verse 17, save me, you are my God. And the truth of the matter is, verse 18, they know nothing. They understand Nothing. Their eyes are plastered over so they cannot see, and their minds are closed so they cannot understand. No one stops to think. I mean, that not that remarkable? Sounds like today, doesn't it? Yeah. Here in the end of uh, ch- the chapter, God is predicting that not only will Jerusalem be destroyed, but that it will be inhabited. And the towns of Judah, they shall be built. And the ruins will be restored. Now, verse 28 is very interesting. God is speaking and he says, Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and will accomplish all that I please? He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt. And of the temple, let its foundations be laid. This prophecy regarding Cyrus was given 175 years before his birth. And it was pointed out to him during his lifetime, yes. if I remember correctly. And yes. He, and he decided to, uh, to do it. This is 175 years before Cyrus is even 
thought of. And his name is right here. Is right here. Now, the point being, why will you kick against the pricks? Something here is destined by God to happen. Don't fight it. Let it happen. Live through it, survive, and go on. That's the same message that God has to give at the end. If you're going to be taken prisoner, you'll be taken prisoner. If you're going to be killed, you'll be killed. If you're going to go hungry, you're going to be hungry. Don't fight it. The other side is coming. Wait on it. And at some point in time, you'll be able to look up in the sky and say, Here is our God. We have waited on him. He is here. That's right. I think the parallelism yeah. is, is so obvious. Oh, yeah. It just stares you right in the oh, face. Yeah. yeah. Um, if I had been living um, with Daniel and I knew that Cyrus was coming under the gates at Babylon, I, that would have been kind of neat to see the prophetic fulfillment knowing that 175 years ago, Isaiah had uttered these words. Well, wouldn't it be kind of neat to watch the progression of the trumpets and uh, yes, and the bowls of wrath yes. uh, as, as you sit and watch these things happen? I, wanna, I want you to watch this chapter 45. It is full of political intrigue, uh, secular politics. I'd like to go there for a minute. I rarely do. I hate it, but I will go there <laughs> because it's in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 45, this is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus, to his chosen. The word anointed means the one chosen. Whose right hand I take hold of to subdue nations before him and to strip kings of their armor and to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. The success of Cyrus belongs to whom? The Lord. The Lord. I will go before you to level the mountains. I will break down gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness, riches stored in secret places, so that you may know I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who summons you by name. For the sake of of Jacob my servant, of Israel my chosen, I summon you by name and bestow on you, Cyrus, a title of honor, though you do not acknowledge me. I am the Lord and there is no other. Apart from me there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me. So that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, men may know there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. We only have about a minute before we've got to turn the tape over, David. I want to bring out three points here in this one minute and then we'll discuss them. God called Cyrus and appointed Cyrus before he was born and put him on a mission. God did the same thing of, Je of Jeremiah. Before he says you were even born, I called you to be a prophet. God has a plan for your life and my life before we're even born. Number two, the success that Cyrus experienced. Cyrus thought, no doubt, he did it. He was just a good statistician and a good strategist. Cyrus was just a good servant. God did all the work. God is the one who busts through the doors. Mm -hmm. It says so, right? God here. is the one that tore down the walls. God did everything, and Cyrus is there to walk through. <laughs> Don't you wish things were that easy today sometimes? It, well. They can be. It's more that way than we think. And then last... And we'll talk about this when God says, I create light and darkness. I, I bring prosperity and create disaster. I want to talk about that in the King James Version when we come back from our inter intermission. Well, we'll take just a few minutes for intermission and we'll be right back. Welcome back to the second half 
of our eighth tape on the book of Isaiah. This also happens to be tape number 14 and the 209 series, Shadows of God. Before the intermission, David and I were talking about uh, Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7. And um, actually here in chapter 45, God is um, giving a beautiful uh, prof prophetic uh, statement about Cyrus, how that he would um, provide the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. And uh, remember, we are 160 to 175 years prior to the birth of um, Cyrus. And um, the fact that God has chosen Cyrus to accomplish his objectives, even though Cyrus does not acknowledge the Most High God. See that in verse 4? I summon you by name and bestow on you a title of honor, though you do not acknowledge me. Cyrus did not get the title by prowess, human, uh, his own human ability. Uh, it was God who bestowed it. Now, I want to make the point that God, when he chooses us and creates us, each one of us, he has a niche where we do our best. And that niche is actually a cooperation with the talents and gifts that he has given us that are innate within us uh, and at the same time in line with his purposes and his will. And whatever special talent he may give us yes. to go with the things that people mm. normally have. Well, what I'm trying to say is that, and this is kind of a hard thing to put in words, but... Try poetry. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> uh, God, in order for the human race to exist and to be sustained, God has provided people with a range of talents and abilities that make it possible. For example, he has given some people the desire to understand the human body and who make a career of working with sick people. Doctors. He has made some to be engineers. He has made some to be bakers. He has made some to be musicians. And yes, he's even made some to be comedians. And even lawyers. Yeah. Scary concept. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. In other words, for the benefit of the human race, God has given to all mankind these several gifts. And when we use our gifts to the best of our ability and are diligent and faithful in the exercise of them, we are accomplishing God's plan and purpose in our lives. Now, if we give our heart to the Lord, we can accomplish even more in God's will. Because He will direct well, plan a, little a. Bit more in, a little bit more intently? Plan A. Plan A is always the higher ideal. Plan B, C, D, E, F still are within his will, but they just can't have such... A, the ideals or the pinnacle of achievement is always reduced with each succeeding plan. You know, I've heard people say, well, Larry, I... I'm sure I'm on plan X, Y, and maybe Z <laughs> in my life. But the productivity level's not quite the, there. Huh? Right. Well, even though Cyrus did not acknowledge the Most High God, he nevertheless saw, came to see his prophetic role in the, in the will of God, and he was honored to make the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem that was given in 536 B.C., 
Now, this is not the decree that is mentioned in Daniel 9, where the 70 weeks would be counting um, when we get to Daniel, we can talk about that. But nevertheless, Cyrus did issue a decree. Now, we want to come to verse 7, Isaiah 45, 7. There is a, a, a concept in this verse that really frustrates a lot of people. And I'm going to read it from the King James Version first. This is Isaiah 45, 7. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Hmm. Boy, I can see where the controversy comes with that. <laughs> God's going to create evil? The King James um, use of English is not quite like we use today. So their their definition of evil is different from the way we use the word evil today. Yes. Uh, I would like to read from the New King James Version. Okay. It goes like this, Isaiah 45, verse 7. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. Well, the, the NIV says, I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. Yes. Um, now, if you took the word evil, how would you reconcile that with an all-righteous God? Well, you can't, see. And that's where the problem rests. God did not create evil. The way we think of evil. The way the law defines transgression. Sin. Yes. God is not responsible for the existence of evil. God is responsible for giving his creatures the power of choice and a law that defines evil. But it was Lucifer's choice and the third of the angels that fell, and Adam and Eve. Uh, it, were, it was their choices to sin. And in so doing, they became responsible for their own undoing. So, if we say, in, in the King James Version, uh, see, the, the Old Testament, many people don't know this, King James Version of the Bible came out in 1611, or actually 1614, I think. It was dated 1611, but it took them about three years, 50 scholars from Oxford, to do the translating and get it all together. The Old Testament in the King James Version is essentially Tyndale's translation, which was done in 1524. Um, the... King James Version really was just the New Testament. They just appended the New Testament to Tyndale's version with a few update, updating and let it go at that. The King James Version that we read today has some 500 changes in it since the original 1611 edition just because of, of things that were not correctly done. And the New King James, I forget how many changes actually are there, but there are numerous. Uh, and the NIV, of course, is a whole new fresh approach, and my favorite approach, to interpreting the original manuscripts. The point is, is that God says, I create disaster. I will bring the sword against Jerusalem. Uh, hold your finger here and go to Ezekiel chapter 14. Let me show you something. Look at um, verse 21. Read that for me, David. For this is what the sovereign Lord says. How much worse will it be when I send against Jerusalem my four dreadful judgments, sword and famine 
and wild beast and plague to kill its men and their animals. So God is taking full accountability, full responsibility for sending destruction upon Jerusalem to kill the, 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 rebel, the rebellious people. So you could say God is bringing this calamity upon Jerusalem. He is the one initiating it. And the calamity would be viewed as evil. Evil. Yeah. As terrible. Yeah. Awful. Right. But that is not the same thing as saying that God created sin. Correct. See the difference. So you, you can't take one verse of Scripture and develop a theology from it. That is Especially when you have other verses of Scripture that are very numerous that say the opposite thing. This is the difference between the fanatic, the zealot, and the student. The student of God's Word is constantly weighing out the evidence to reach and support a conclusion. The zealot or fanatic is looking for a proof text upon which to hang his entire theology. And in his own blind foolishness, he insists that one text is the full definition of the, of the whole picture. Well, the Lord fairly well answers that. He talks about one of the kings that he he uses the analogy of a peg being driven into a wall. Yes, we here, right. We just covered that a few He's going to drive that peg into the wall and hang everything on it. Mm -hmm. But the other peg, the old peg, the weight is going to kill it. It's mm -hmm. going to pull it out of the wall mm -hmm. and the entire family, the entire kingdom right. will fall because that peg could not hold up. That's right. That's right. And we just covered that here a few days ago, ago in our study. I'm looking here in Isaiah just where that was because I can't seem to put my face, my finger on the chapter here. Here it is, chapter 22. Yeah. And the Lord says, um, I will drive him like a peg into a firm place. He will be a seat of honor for the house of his father, and all the glory of his family will hang on him. But in that day, the peg driven into the firm place will give way and be sheared off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's you can't hang everything on one peg or one nail. No, you've you've got no. to have the entire support. How would you like to have a house? The house. How would you like to have a house built with one nail, <laughs> <laughs> or or built on one pillar, just just one pillar? Yeah. And you know, you know, the wind could blow the thing over. Why? You know. Come people, on, but guys. people will build their house of theology, mm -hmm. see, mm -hmm. you know, with one nail or on one pillar. Yeah. Okay, so these three things from Isaiah 45 I thought were very profound. God knows us before we're born. God has a purpose for us. And yes, the Lord, He does. Contrary to what many will say, God does bring and create disaster. And He plainly says, I, the Lord, do all these things. And it doesn't depend on your acknowledgement. No, no. Look at verse um, 12, Isaiah 45, 12. It is I who made the earth and created mankind upon it. Jesus is talking. My own hands stretched out the heavens. I marshaled their starry hosts. I will raise up Cyrus in my righteousness and I will make all his ways straight. He will rebuild my city and set my exiles free, but not for a price or reward. He's going to do it because he wants to do it. Just out of the goodness of his heart. Yes, yes. Isaiah says, Truly you are a God, in verse 15, who hides himself, O God and Savior of Israel. What he's saying here, God works behind the scenes. God is invisible. God can't be seen. But yet, He's in everything. To, to put God visually before us would be very deceiving, very deceptive. Because like with the gods of the Baals, 
you could think when you leave, he's there, I'm here. And that is not the case. Wherever you go, there he is. And to have the idea that he's over there and he can't hear what you're saying or thinking is entirely wrong. And you'll wind up doing things and saying things that you shouldn't. Well, it's the carnal nature. <laughs> That's right. It's the carnal nature. Uh, again, it's, it's a limit put on God yes. in our own minds. Yes. It has nothing to do with reality. That's right. Verse 17, But Israel will be saved by the Lord with an everlasting salvation. You will never be put to shame or disgraced to ages everlasting. Now, I must remind you that when the, in the time of Christ, the Pharisees applied verse 17 to themselves. The Pharisees understood a number of the prophecies of Isaiah as pertaining to the restoration of Jerusalem. And they saw themselves as the people of God who had been restored, who had gone through the spanking, the, the, the judgments, you know, the retribution, the vengeance, the wrath of God. And now the Pharisees were a sect within the Jewish faith committed to doing everything humanly possible to please God. So that none of this happened again. That's correct. And they were very good at it, if you listened to what they had to say about it. They, uh, they were zealous uh, t to obtain righteousness. But they went about it all wrong. They missed the entire point and, and this is kind of interesting how the pendulum has swung. Before the Babylonian captivity, Israel is worshiping the Baals constantly. After the Babylonian captivity, Israel is worshiping Jehovah. No Baals. No more Baals after Babylon. But isn't it ironic that they go as far wrong after the captivity, as they did before the captivity. Basically, they're behaving the same way. They're just different ends of the spectrum. Yes, yes. Which tells us that there are three, there are three dimensions in religion. One is legalism. You know, the Pharisees had exceeded at that. This is after they kept the Babylonian exile. The one before that is paganism or where man defines his own God and, you know, does whatever he will. But the third dimension is where man, with humble heart, opens up to the Spirit to let the Spirit lead him in the way of God. And this last dimension is the most difficult dimension because the Spirit will lead you where you don't want to go. The Spirit will lead you in an experience that you don't want to have. The Spirit will take you into a life of faith, which is scary and not quite predictable. The Spirit is ever trying to break up our self-confidence so that God's will and purpose for us in the first place can be accomplished. And that's exactly opposite of what the other two dimensions are doing. Exactly. They're trying to build up your self-confidence. They're, they're trying to lead you into things that are comfortable. Well, either you're establishing your own righteousness, as the legalist is all about, you know. And we can comfortably do that. Yes, think we can <laughs> you know it, it's all about make-believe mm -hmm. because the righteousness that God requires has you know is so far beyond anything we can produce it, it, it's laughable but people can be can be led to believe that they are righteous and doing right and, and these same people can be led to condemn those that don't do as they do that's pretty easy in the realm of human right. nature very comfortable yeah on the other hand mm-hmm 
On, on the other hand, you've got people who make up God any way they want it to be, yeah. which can be very comfortable. Yeah. Oh, that's the most, that's the most comforting of all. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's create our own God and let's establish what God likes and what God doesn't like and what God accepts, and we'll, we'll create our own, roll our own as we go, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. So the, 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 there, there are three directions of spiritual growth two of which are useless, harmful, actually. So in verse 19, God says, I have not spoken in secret, for somewhere in a land of darkness, I have not said to Jacob's descendants, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak the truth. I declare what is right. Gather together and come. Assemble, you fugitives from the nations. Ignorant are those who carry about idols of wood, who pray to gods that cannot save. Ignorant, that's what God says of them. Verse 21, he says, look, declare what is to be. Present it. Let them take counsel together. Who foretold this long ago? Who declared it in the distant past? Was it not I, the Lord? And there is no God apart from me a righteous God and a Savior, there is none but me. Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Before me every knee will bow, by me every tongue will swear. They will say of me, in the Lord alone are righteousness and strength. And all who have raged against him will come to him and be put to shame. That will happen, David, at the end of the thousand years. Isn't that going to be quite a feeling to come before God and to realize that all the strength you thought you had and to look at God and his strength and his power and his majesty and his glory? (laughs) I am reminded of an incident. I used to have a little sports car that had these really monster fog lights on the front of it. And I could turn those things up and light up the ditches for a long way. And you could run pretty good at night. One night I was running home through a crooked, really enjoyable road back in the country. And I had these things on. And I thought, man, this is cool. Look at all the light I'm putting out. About that time, I mean, I had no more than thought that. Then this bolt of lightning comes across the sky and lit up the entire landscape as far as I could see. And I I remember consciously thinking, whoops, okay, Lord, you got it. (laughs) I mean, I have never felt so humble. All all of a sudden, this little light of mine... (laughs) I mean, it just just totally trashed yeah. all this all this fifty watts. Of yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say this little light of mine ain't no big light. <laughs> it really puts things in perspective real oh, clear. I me. mean, just lit up the entire mountainside. <laughs> oh, be. I remember. I remember in Vietnam. Oh, one night we were. under red alert, and all the lights were extinguished in our camp. Um, Even um, uh, no no cigarette lighters were allowed under red alert. No matches. No matches, no uh, No, cigarettes. No flashlights. No flashlights, nothing. I mean, it's it's a total blackout situation. Well... um, there was a. I was in a ditch. Um, my my post where I was assigned was in this particular ditch, and uh, I'm I'm lying there listening and basically just looking up at the stars. You know, every now and then you raise up to look around. You know, to see if anything if you is crawling your way. Right. I mean, red alert can last five or six hours. Mm-hmm. You know, red alert means the potential for enemy contact um, is very great. Enemy have been sighted moving 
And uh, so every man to his battle station. And if a sapper is crawling through the wire, you've got a problem. Yeah. Well, I'm laying here in the ditch, and, um, I, you know, I raise up and look around. And the, the bunker, where there's a, a 50 caliber machine gun, uh, is, you know, maybe 30 feet away. And inside the bunker are three guys. One has a 50 caliber, and the other two uh, are there to assist. And they also have, you know, their M16s. Well, after an hour or, or an hour and a half of red alert and nothing happening, you know, um, those that smoke really begin to really fidget pretty badly. They, they need a nicotine, you know, boost. They need a fix. A fix. So um, I heard this one guy say, he said, he said to his buddy over there, he said, Joe, you got a light, I need a smoke. And um, Joe said, yeah, he said, I got a light. And so the guy, I, you know, you hear him fussing around there, and pretty soon he's dug through his poncho liner, and he's got his cigarettes out. And uh, Joe shows up with um, um, a, a lighter, uh, it was from what I could tell. And Joe, you know, uh, clicked it, and uh, I couldn't see it because they're down inside the bunker, you know. And I, I remember hearing the guy with the cigarette say, Joe, that ain't no light. <laughs> 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 Evidently, the flame, they had turned the flame down or done something so that it you know, it wouldn't be seen, <laughs> and, it was, it was, and it wasn't enough fire there to light his cigarette. <laughs> and I, <laughs> so when you said, uh, you know, you, you've got your bright halogens wide open, <laughs> you know, and, and, and the lightning just turns the whole heavens on, this little light of mine, that ain't no light. <laughs> you got that right. <laughs> that's where that came to mind. Well... Israel was chosen to be the light of the world, and when time came to let their light shine, they had no light. God was totally disgusted. He had invested many, many, many centuries dealing with this rebellious people. Now, the, the significance of the light is, going back to your story, the Viet Cong snipers had rifles that were good for about 500 yards. Now, folks, that's 1,500 feet. That's quite a ways. That's more than a quarter mile. And, uh, and they could put a bullet, they could put a NATO round in a six-inch diameter slot from 500 yards or 500 meters. Uh, the Americans had rifles that would do 1,500 and if they got everything squared away on a Browning 50 caliber, they actually killed people at 2,500 yards. Now, they actually did this. It's documented. Wow. The light from one cigarette can easily be seen in the dark 2,500 yards. And you don't want a 50 caliber slug coming at you in the middle of the night. No. Headed for no. something that you're holding up next to your no, face. No, not hardly. So light can be seen from a long way, yeah. and God wanted Israel to be a light yes. so that people could see it a yeah. long way. Yes. And they were refusing to yes. do it. Yes. This is one thing that um, in chapter 46, God is predicting the utter collapse of the, of the false gods. Ba uh, Bel bows down, Nebo stoops low. Their idols are born by beasts of burden. In other words, <laughs> idols can't get from one place to the other except they're carried by, <laughs> by a donkey. <laughs> a donkey. <laughs> <laughs> they stoop low and bow down together, unable to rescue the burden. <laughs> they themselves go off into captivity. He said, come, come on, can't, can't you guys learn from this? Yeah. The idols go into captivity yeah, that's also. Right. Yeah, they're carried away. You know, what is it about this you can't understand, God is saying. He says, listen to me, O house of Jacob. Listen to me. 
You whom I have upheld since you were conceived and have carried you since your birth. Even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. To whom will you compare me or count me equal? To whom will you liken me that we may be compared? God says, look, I have no compare. Verse 9, I am God. There is no other. There is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning. From ancient times, what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. From the east, I summon a bird of prey. From a far off land, a man to fulfill my purpose. What I have said, that will I bring about. What I have planned, that will I do. Listen to me, you stubborn hearted you who are far from righteousness, I am bringing my righteousness near. It is not far away, and my salvation will not be delayed. I will grant salvation to Zion, my splendor to Israel. The point I want to make here, the Pharisees kept reading Isaiah and applying that to the Israel and to the religious structure that they had made, to the Israel that they had defined. And the Israel of God is not defined by man. In fact, the Israel that God had in mind and the Israel that the nation had become were poles apart. And Jesus even referred to them as vipers. Yes. You snakes. Yes. You're not anywhere thing close to what I had in mind. That's right. That's right. So the it is the nature of religion to appropriate to itself and make itself the centerpiece of God's handiwork on earth. And they appropriate the um, the ability to define what what righteousness and and what the attributes of God are. See if you can answer this question without incriminating yourself. Uh, this ought to be good. <laughs> now what? Would you would you say that it is the nature of every church that you are acquainted with to make the claim that it has and the truth about God? Yes, I think that's a fair statement. Would you say that it is a fair statement that every religion that you are acquainted with holds that all other religions are inferior yeah, I think that's a fair statement. Would you agree that every religion then on earth exalts itself above all others? Yes, and this creates a situation where everything is mutually exclusive. Everybody can't be right. Yeah, yeah. It, what, the point I'm making is that it's the nature of religion to assume, A, it has the truth about God, B, it is the apple of God's eye, and C, it is the highest uh, form of truth on the planet. On the planet. And so, the, and so that there is an egocentric core in every religion. And this was very true of Israel when Christ came. And it defends it to the death. Yes. Yes. What is it about religion that does this? I don't know, but it but it will 
sacrifice everything else to defend its definition. It'll sacrifice people. It'll sacrifice attitudes. It'll sacrifice whatever is necessary to sacrifice to maintain that specific point of view. Ultimately, religion is all about acquiring power and controlling people. Sounds like government. It is a form of government. That's why in Revelation, the seven heads, which are the seven religious systems of the world, are called seven kings. And they are attached to a body that also has ten horns, mm -hmm. which are obviously political Right, in the nature. political powers. So they're mm -hmm. part of the same animal. Mm -hmm. They really are. And that's why they're really um, ultimately the operation of church and the operation of state actually run parallel to each other. And Jesus makes the comment, I'm going to cut off the head yes. and the tail. Yes, yes. In the last few minutes we have, uh, I would like to um, uh, take on chapters 47 and 48. We only have about five minutes. I would like to um, point out that here in this setting of poetry, here in this setting of, of marvelous words and expressions of, of emotion, God says very number important things that his people should hear and remember while they are in captivity. Um, and as this is studied in generations to come, it's designed to be a learning uh, tool so that history is not repeated. Notice uh, verse 6, Isaiah 47, 6. I was angry with my people and desecrated my inheritance. I gave them into your hand, O Babylon, and, showed, and you showed them no mercy. Even on the aged, you laid a very heavy yoke. You said in your heart, O Babylon, I will continue forever, the eternal queen. But you did not consider these things or reflect on what might happen to you. Now then listen, you wanton creature, lounging in your security and saying to yourself, I am and there is none beside me. I will never be a widow or suffer the loss of children. Both of these calamities will overtake you in a moment on a single day, loss of children and widowhood. They will come upon you in full measure in spite of your many sorceries and all your potent spells. You have trusted in your wickedness and have said no one sees my political savvy. Your wisdom and knowledge mislead you when you say to yourself, I am and there is none besides me. Disaster will come upon you, and you will not know how to conjure it away. A calamity will fall upon you that you cannot ward off with a ransom. A catastrophe you cannot foresee will suddenly come upon you. Does that sound like Revelation 18? Mm -hmm. Peace and safety. Verse 8, lounging in your security and saying, I am and there is none besides me. Yeah. Sounds like they're saying peace and safety to me. Well, in Revelation 18, listen to, to uh, what the Bible says here. In verse 7, give her as much torture and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit as a queen, I am not a widow and I will never mourn. Therefore, in one day, her plagues will overtake her death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. Here we're talking about the great harlot of Revelation 17 and 18. And God is saying, Come out of her, my people, that you not receive what she's about to be you know, receiving. And in her heart, she says, I sit as queen. I am not a widow. 
what this is, this is language coming from Isaiah. Mm -hmm. We just read it. You, uh, you, you say to yourself, I am, and there is none besides me. I will continue forever, the eternal queen ruling over the earth. I will never be a widow or suffer the loss of children. Both of these will overtake you in a moment on a single day, loss of children and widowhood. They will come upon you in full measure in spite of anything you can do. And, and she has trusted in her wickedness. In yes. other words, she's been an adulteress. Yes. No one sees she me. Fig she figures that she can, can, yeah. can get around this. Right. It is the nature of political and religious organizations to see themselves the invincible. The invincible. And God says, Not so. It's going to come, and there's no way out. That's right. That's right. Chapter 48, we have one minute to go here. I have wanted to cover this in more detail, but I can see our time is getting away, and we are going to conclude our study in Isaiah in our next tape. We're going to do it, ready or not. <laughs> Nine <laughs> tapes on the book of Isaiah uh, have got to be enough. One last statement here. I'd like for you to, to jump down to um, verse 2. You who call yourselves citizens of the holy city and rely on the God of Israel, the Lord Almighty is his name. I foretold the former things long ago, and my mouth announced them, and I made them known. Then suddenly I acted, and they came to pass. For I knew how stubborn you were, and I told you these things long ago before they happened. I announced them so that you could not say my idols did them. God wants everyone to know that all other allusions to God other than himself, that is Jesus Christ, are false allusions. God wants the world to know that he is what he says he is. Now you can make him out to be something entirely different, but that will only bring your own ruin. Isaiah 48, we'll pick up there next time. We're out of time for now. It's been a joy to be with you today, David. Yeah, it's been, it's been fun. I've enjoyed it a lot. Appreciate you coming and being here, and we'll see you next time when we continue with our ninth tape <laughs> and last tape in the book of Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah. <laughs>